What's uh, stood out to you about uh, Rutgers so far? Uh, I think they're really good in transition. Um, they've been very good defensively. Kid Baker and Harper uh, have been very impressed with them on tape. Um, Baker, I think, has a really good feel for the game. Uh, can go off the bounce, can shoot it. His percentage is not great, but it looks good every time it leaves his hand. And then Harper is, you know, a kid that's a wing, but he's really big, really strong, and so he can pull some mismatch problems. Um, and so I've, I've been impressed with them. I think they're well coached. I think they play hard. I think they compete. I think they play very well together. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good team. It would be a good challenge for us. When you have to stop the transition game, does that in any way compromise your rebounding, defensive rebounding? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, you know, we, we uh, it may affect our offensive rebounding a little bit. Maybe we don't send as many guys because we're cognizant of that we have to have, make sure we have good balance and things like that. Sometimes when you're playing against a team that doesn't run, you know, you maybe just send more guys to the glass because you know they're not going to push it. They're not going to maybe take advantage of it. And so I don't I don't think it, it should. You know, we struggle rebounding. You know, that's something that we've been inconsistent with. Hopefully we can start to become a consistently good rebounding team. How do you Obviously, only eight games here, Jeff, so it's a small sample size. But, you know, I had seen where, you know, it's measured by like possessions per game. Y'all are one of the 20 uh, slowest teams in Division One so far this season. I, I was curious how much of that's just kind of happenstance or how much of that's like a conscious strategic. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't pay attention to that. So I, I, I'm not, and so I don't, I don't necessarily understand the points per possession, the metrics and things like that. So it's, you know, I don't know, like, we, we, we haven't shot the ball well, so I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Um, you know, we've turned it over, you know, against Kansas State, we had 22 turnovers, so that could maybe have some, I don't know if it, like, we've struggled to score. So I don't know, I, I don't know how they formulate all these things. You know, it's not that we have made a conscious effort to slow things down. We want to get out and get as many easy baskets as we can, certainly, um, with the way we've struggled to score, we would rather do that. I thought that's something that helped us against Northwestern, especially in the first half. We were able to get out um, and get some baskets in transition from our defense. Uh, but it's not anything where we've consciously said, hey, let's slow it down or play at one of the slowest paces. I think that's what you said yeah. in the country. That's not what we want to do. It's just what's happened in, in eight games. Yes. What are those <clears throat> those next steps to get some consistency on the half court offense? Well, it would help if we make shots. I mean, that always helps your offense. And you know, in, in some of these games, we've had wide open looks. We we just you know we have to be able to step up to the plate and make some shots. That certainly would help getting better movement. I think the past couple of games we've been a little bit better at that. We have to become consistently. Uh, good at that um, and then understanding how to play without the ball uh, I think that's something that will help too you, have, you said you have issues rebounding issues shooting but you're 6-2 and two. what do you think has contributed to your success for the most well I think our defense has been pretty good um, and I think for the most part we fall um, and so I think that's one of the reasons I mean out of the eight games four of them have been against power five conferences so it's you know, we've, we've played, I think, a challenging schedule so far. Obviously, this week is a, another big challenge for us. Um, but I think, you know, we've defended. We've, we've fought. We've made timely shots in some of the games uh, where we maybe haven't shot well, but we've made some timely shots to give us a little bit of separation or to give us a lead. Um, I guess that's... While we're sitting here with the record, so the mindset as much as it is. I think the mindset. Yeah, I think you know. I thought, I thought against West Virginia, our inability to make shots hurt us everywhere else. I mean, that was, you know, really bad. And I think that affected defense. I think that affected everything because we just couldn't see the ball go through the basket. Um, 
I think we've grown up from that a little bit from that experience and, and we've been able to to defend pretty well I think even in the midst of these droughts that we've had in just about every game. Coach when you look at you guys and Rutgers you're kind of similar teams on paper you know not great shooters but can defend really well both up and coming programs a little bit how important what is it like to kind of be able to look across uh, the other sideline and see a team that looks a lot like you guys? Yeah, well, I mean, I have a lot of respect for their program, especially their coach. Uh, I think he's a really, really good coach, and I think he does things the right way, and um, he took over a tough situation, and they made strides. Um, I don't look at them and say, hey, they're like us. I just look at them and say, hey, I think they're pretty good. I think they have good talent. I think he... I think he maximizes the talent. I think he puts his guys in positions for them to have success individually and collectively. Um, and to me, that's the sign of a good coach and a program that's going in the right direction. And I think they are. Uh, going back a little bit to the base discussion, Jeff. I mean, given what, given how Trey and X play there, you know, some of their characteristics and their attributes. I mean, <clears throat> You know, you've said previously where you're not wedded to a particular style where you like to meld it around your your personnel. How ideally would you kind of like your team to play, given you know, given some of the traits of the two guys who, who I guess overwhelmingly have the ball in their hands? I'd like us not to turn the ball over. That's been a problem for us. I'd like us to, uh, you know, be able to make some shots. I'd like for us to be stingy defensively. I'd like for us to get easy baskets when we can. Um, and I like for us to win, period. So whatever it takes to win, I, that's 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 what I'd like us to do. Jeff, this is a little off, off the board, but I, I know you've got to know Mike Tomlin pretty well uh, since you got here. Given the year that they've had with the adversity that they've had and kind of your dealings with him, what have you kind of taken away from you know, your relationship with him and? What kind of impresses you about what he's been able to do in, as a coach under those circumstances? Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. I mean, I guess people maybe nationally or maybe locally are, but I'm not surprised. I think Mike thrives in these situations. I think he's a really good coach. And really good coaches, you figure out a way. And you have to make adjustments. And I think they've made adjustments. He and his staff has made it. I think they've made adjustments. Um, I think Mike has stayed positive. And I think that permeates throughout the culture of their organization and especially their football team. He instills a belief in those guys because of the belief that he has in himself and his system. And so I'm not surprised by it. I'm obviously happy for him, happy for them, um, but it's not something I'm surprised by. I think year in and year out, I think he's been one of the best coaches in the NFL. And it's unfortunate that they've had to lose everyone for people to maybe appreciate that. Um, sometimes you can take really good things for granted. You know, during the season, Jeff, things obviously get incredibly busy. I mean, how much time do you have for things like that, like to watch a football game? Or I make time for it. Look, I'm, I'm busy, but this is my job. It's not my life. So I make time for it. I make time to watch that. I make time to spend time with my family, especially my kids. As much as I can, I try to make time, spend time with my wife. Uh, to do things fun. I don't watch tape 24 hours a day or do basketball 24 hours a day. This is something that I love and I'm passionate about, but it's not my life. Um, that's something I learned from my dad. And uh, it's, it's something I've really tried to be cognizant of. Family, friends, doing things that are fun. Those things are way more important than uh, just wins and losses, so. Were you like as a young coach too, or? Did... I don't know. I don't remember, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know. How easy can it be to kind of lose uh, to kind of lose that balance though, where you're in such a high profile gig and there's pressure on you, and yeah, I, I think people expect you sometimes to never sleep and watch film constantly. Yeah, I mean it's it's. Um, I think it depends on who you are and where you are in your profession and where you are in your career. You know, I've, I've been fired, so I've been at the lowest point. Um, I've also been a guy that at 27 had a job that people didn't think that I should have. And, you know, 
at 31, I was in a Power 5 conference. At, at 33 or 34, whatever age, I think it was 33, I was in the Elite Eight um, and finished the season ranked fifth or sixth, depending on what poll you looked at. And so I've, I've been through a lot of different things in this profession, even though I, I still consider myself young. Um, and so it's, it's easy when you're a young coach to get caught up and wrapped up into, well, this is what I think coaching should be. Um, one of the great things that I've had, and I've been very fortunate, I had a dad that was in the profession and that he coached at every level. But then one of the best pieces of advice I got when I got into this and I became a head coach was from my college coach. And he said to me, you know, don't try to be your dad and don't try to be me. Don't try to be him. You know, be you and be very comfortable with that because who you are is good enough. And so I've really tried to, to lean on that. I've been fortunate to be in these amazing situations and in these positions. Um, one of the coolest things, it was in 2014, I was uh, on a plane with Coach K and Coach Behan, headed from Colorado Springs to Las Vegas for the U.S. national team, USA national team. We were getting ready for the World Cup. And I sat there and I just watched and I listened to them. I think it was about an hour and 15 minute flight. I just listened to him. I didn't really say a word unless I was asked a question. And I remember when we landed in Vegas, I called my wife and I said to her, you know, I just sat for an hour and 15 minutes and listened to these two guys and both of them will have over a thousand wins. So it would be over 2,000 wins between them. And they're so different. And it's the perfect example of you have to be comfortable doing it the way you do it. Coach could never do it the way Coach Mayhem does it. Coach Mayheim couldn't do it the way Coach does it, but they're both incredibly comfortable with the way they do it. And it's so different, it's polar opposite, but they've won a lot of games. And so you have to be comfortable with who you are. There's some coaches that may watch tape all day and do that, and this is their life. And it's nothing wrong with that. I, at least for me, I don't judge anyone. But for me, I'm comfortable with who I am now. I probably wasn't as a younger coach because you're trying to figure it all out and things like that. But with me, I'm very comfortable with who I am. So this is an important part of my life, but it's not my life. Have you ever felt like that advice has been, like that advice that you've taken about just being yourself and trying to be normal has been challenged in terms of? Not really. Not really. I don't think so. Um, maybe when I was a younger coach, but certainly not uh, since I've been in, in, in the position I'm in, I'm in here. You know, when we first got here, Jeff, we had seen uh, Kenny shooting a little bit. You know, it's obviously different than playing in a game, but I was curious where he is. Yeah, he's still a ways away. I mean, it's got a strength. He's got to strengthen um, the hip. I mean, he's able to do a lot of stuff now, but you're talking about you haven't played basketball or done anything at an incredibly physical, strenuous level since we beat Boston College last year in the ACC tournament because he didn't play in the Syracuse game. So that was early March. And so he's able to do a little bit more, but there's no contact. There's, and I don't know where we are as far as timetable for that to happen. I'm not sure when that will happen. Do you think losing a guy like Gerald early on kind of helped Justin kind of get into the fire even more? And no, I don't think that helped. I just think, you know, being in the fire, I mean, Justin is a guy that, you know, we thought would be a very important part of what we were going to do, especially after the trip to Italy. And then he had the injury that we thought, okay, well, he probably can't play this year. And then three weeks later, three and a half weeks later, you know, it's okay, let's go play. And so I don't think Gerald's injury had anything to do with that. Um, I just think, you know, thrown in the fire right away, Florida State, the competition that we played early, I think that's helped him. And then being able to practice, being able to consistently practice, that was the first time once we start, since probably the end of September, since he's been in college, that he's been able to consistently practice, knock on wood, that he's been able to do that. So I think that's been the biggest thing that's helped. What does that say about uh, Justin as both a person and a player, that he went from potentially not being able to play this year to he was MVP of the Fort Myers tournament? What does it say about his ability to, I guess, deal with the adversity or... Yeah, you know, I'm not surprised about that part, the dealing with the adversity. I've always thought he was a tough kid, you know, where he's from, where he played in high school, who he played for, um, his family, his background, all of those things. 
Um, so, so I'm not surprised by that. One of the things that was really interesting is that when he had the injury, when it happened, I was there, and it was it was gruesome, and you thought, but the next day he's saying to us like, "I'm fine, I'm playing," and so he was like, you know, bothering the trainer to get back out there. Like he he, I'm not hurt, I'm fine, even if it's torn. Like I'm playing, like I'm good, my knee feels fine. So he had that right away that, you know what, like I'm going to be okay. That maybe surprised me a little bit because most times when a kid has potentially what you think is a maybe season-ending injury, they're distraught, they're broken up, and he was actually the opposite. Like, I'm fine. I'm good. After a week, it's I don't need these crutches. I'm good. We're, so we had to slow him down. Um, and so I, I, I just think if, if he can, if we can, you know, keep him healthy and he can consistently practice and, and really get, I think you're going to, I hope that his growth just continues because he has a chance to, I think, be a really good player, but he's got to fall in love with the process of, of, of becoming the best version of what he can be. You talked a few weeks ago about Justin, you think he can reach, you know, a few more levels like you just said, but he needs to improve his motor, I guess, like you said, fall in, fall in love with the process. Did you see that at all since? You know, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it every day. You know, again, we, we've been on him, and I told him I'm going to be on him because he has a chance to be really good, and our program needs for him to become really good. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've seen growth in him from, from day one. How long was that injury before the start of the season? Justin's? Yeah. Uh, it was the second week of school. So I don't remember the exact date. So sometime but in September. It was sometime early September. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, Geraldine, is there still no timetable or is there more? Yeah, I mean, he won't play this week. I know that. But I don't know anything after that. I mean, we play twice this week. And then I don't think we play until the 16th. So I don't know. But I know he won't play this week. And I know he's not close to playing this week. I know that. So I know that he won't do that. But other than that, I'm not sure. Looking ahead to Friday, is there anything that you guys can draw on from your win last year last year against Louisville that helped you down there? Not really. I mean, we're different. They're different. Not really. I mean, I haven't seen them, so I don't know. I just know that they're more experienced. They have a lot of guys back. They have a, one of the top recruiting classes. I watched them briefly early, um, I think, in their Miami game. I watched a little bit of that. But I don't know them enough to – get into detail about them. I mean, my focus has been on Rutgers, so I don't I don't know Louisville enough. I just know that they're really good. I think I just saw they're number one in the country now. Um, and I know they're very, very talented. All right. Thanks, Carson. Thanks.